were probably the largest and arguably the most complete bird collection in the world. We've got a million specimens representing skins like we have here in front of us, but also eggs, nests, skeletons, and specimens preserved in alcohol. That represents 95% of avian diversity across the planet. This is a large-billed ground finch from the Galapagos Islands, um, collected by Charles Darwin. This is the inaccessible island rail. So this is the smallest species of flightless bird in the world. This is the standard winged nightjar. This is a wide-eyed river martin. This is a kermadec petrel. This is a, a falconet. It's the smallest bird of prey in the world. This fellow here, which is the flesh-footed shearwater, it's probably the species that's most affected by plastic ingestion. And the great thing about museum collections is, especially for ours, most of it predates the plastic era. So we know that uh, the contaminant levels in, in some of the birds that we see now is, in some cases, tens of times higher than it was 100 years ago. Being able to go back in time gives us a really unique insight into how the planet has changed in the last 250 years. So if you look at specimens from certain areas, really industrial areas, from the early 1900s, you see just a huge increase in in black soot. That's just atmospheric stuff. And you can compare that with birds that came before and birds that came after. And you can see the effect of things like clean air legislation or massive increase in, in coal burning. The anatomical collections that we've got here are, I'm going to make the argument that they're probably the most important in the world. We've had inquiries from folks who are trying to work out whether we might have traces of the original Spanish flu as an avian flu if we had waterfowl from that particular point in time. We've had architects looking at how skeletons structure can sort of help them solve a structural problem. We've had people looking at ostriches because they're looking at dinosaurs and trying to work out how they moved, or pterosaurs, how they flew with the head structures. The modern period of the collections is a couple of hundred years old. We actually have material that's much older than that, and some of that is research that I'm working on. We have a collection of ancient Egyptian bird mummies, which go back to about 2,000 years. What we've got in this box is a large falcon uh, called a sacred falcon. The ancient Egyptians worshipped raptors as the kind of physical presence of a number of their gods. It's fascinating as a preparator, working on modern specimens for their long-term preservation, to be working with the material that a preparator a very long time ago, albeit for very different reasons, but it's a, it's a ritual preparation to preserve something um, and store it. Uh, although they weren't intending to come, come back to them to look at them afterwards. For myself, I think what was absolutely fascinating when we started looking at these is that mummies are not a single individual. So it is not a question of one bird, one package. They might be missing their head, they might be missing their feet, they might have some extra bits. There might be a package that doesn't have any whole birds in at all, it's just pieces. So that that variation and wondering why that's occurring, that's been fascinating. We're interested in looking for signs of injury or disease that might tell us about how the birds were looked after in life. Were they sacrificed? Were they captive bred? What are those signatures that we might, we might spot because we've got a different perspective of experience here to, to most other people looking at animal mummies? It's really important that we understand the breeding ecology of birds. It's important to have verifiable examples that you can study in different ways. This is what's so fantastically interesting about eggs. They're an external womb adapted to every terrestrial environment on Earth, from the coldest, driest places in Antarctica through to the tropics. So actually, as a model for evolution, understanding the allometry, the shape and size of eggs, the number of eggs in a clutch, the different patterns, all of these things, it makes it actually a fantastically interesting, endless array of material for study. 
and we know so little about the breeding biology of birds in some respects. The thing that I always like to try and point out with the great orc is that now these are seen as some of the most extraordinary biological treasures in any museum collection. But what you have to remember is it's just an eggshell. And over the course of time on Earth when the great orcs were around, there were millions of these, millions and millions and millions of these shells. And now all we've got is this and a few others. And everything that we can understand about that organism is based on the study of these last vestiges. In understanding the breeding ecology of any organism, especially something which has been lost, it tells you something about the evolution of that particular organism, whether it was more closely related, as we think, to one particular species or to another, whether its ecology was more closely related to one species or another. And then that gives you, you know, baseline scientific data, which is always important. But going forward, it gives us a lesson, a salient lesson for the future, because this has to mean something to you, to me, and to future generations. Perhaps one of the most exciting areas going forward is going to be the large AI-driven computational sort of projects, which are going to suddenly be able to take vast amounts of information. Advances in, in things like AI, computer vision um, and, and transcription, so being able to more quickly link specimen labels, uh, which are handwritten in a lot of cases, with diaries and monographs, and, and put specimens in that additional context. Right now, that's a manual job. You, I would have to go and read, you know, Darwin's uh, voyage on the Beagle, the chapter when he was around the Galapagos Islands, and any other chapter where he talked about finches, to contextualize his collection of that, of that specimen. You know, new chemical techniques, looking at things like, um, you know, we can do heavy metals, that's very easy, but um, the European Chemicals Database has something like 20,000 chemicals in its, in its registry, and I expect reasonably soon we'll be able to quickly uh, and cheaply take something like a feather sample or a skin sample uh, and look at, at 20,000 chemicals in the blink of an eye. The research of the mummies is, is, is a brilliant example of how technology moves on, opening up you know, worlds of new questions that these, that these birds can answer. Also, people are starting to look at um, the kind of isotope signals from the physical remains that might shed light on where, you know, is this a bird that's being migrated in from somewhere else, or was it born and bred in, in ancient Egypt? So there's lots of questions still coming out. DNA is a really tricky one because the preservation techniques mess with it so much. So that would be fascinating if somebody can solve that and one day, here they are, the specimens are waiting for it. Mm -hmm.